Hello, my name is Dr. Amir Garakani. I am a attending psychiatrist and the director of education here at Silver Hill. And uh, I'm very excited that we're having a Grand Rounds program today. Uh, before I get into uh, the speaker, who is Dr. Catherine Phillips, let me just let everybody know that um, at the end of the Grand Rounds, you can um, fill out a survey to, um, to an educational survey to note your presence here. You can also ask questions during the um, by clicking on the Q&A button on the right side of your screen with a bubble, two uh, speech bubbles. So during the course of the uh, Grand Rounds, you can ask questions and then towards the end of the talk, uh, Dr. Phillips uh, will answer those questions. Well, let me start by introducing Dr. Phillips. Uh, she is a professor of psychiatry at DeWitt Wallace Senior Scholar and a psychiatry residency, residency research director at Well Cornell Medical School and an attending psychiatrist at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, she's also an adjunct professor of psychiatry at Brown. Dr. Phillips is an internationally recognized researcher in the field of body dysmorphic disorder and other obsessive compulsive disorders. She's done extensive research funded by NIH and received numerous honors and awards for her research um, and done me mentoring in the field and received a commendation from the APA for her research. She's published over 300 papers and edited 11 books and given over 590 presentations uh, including twice at Silver Hill previously. Uh, she's on the scientific advisory boards of the American Society of Clinical Psychopharmacology, the ADAA, and the International OCD Foundation, and has served on numerous editorial boards and has been involved in the work groups on DSM-5 for obsessive compulsive spectrum, post-traumatic stress, and dissociative disorders. Uh, she served as the NIMH uh, Research Review Committee uh, Chair and is a fellow of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology and a member of the American College of Psychiatrists, as am I. <laughs> uh, I had a, and uh, she's also a distinguished fellow of the APA. Uh, so interestingly, Dr. Phillips um, is known to Dr. Gerber, and uh, he came to me uh, a year and a half ago and said, we should invite Dr. Phillips. Um, and this is right after she had written a really wonderful uh, editorial in the New York Times, uh, or op-ed in the New York Times about body dysmorphic disorder in men. And I said, don't worry, we already invited her. <laughs> so she was supposed to come uh, earlier. And I think Dr. Phillips, it was in, in March or so, but COVID happened. Um, but I'm really happy that she's here and really excited that she's gonna be giving this talk. So Dr. Phillips, hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Garakani, for your lovely introduction. I'm really delighted to be here virtually today to talk with you about body dysmorphic disorder. I'd like to just start by thanking those of you at Silver Hill who've taken care of some of my very ill patients with BDD. I do refer them to you because you do great clinical work um, and my patients have done very well under your care. So it's really fantastic to know you are there as a resource. In fact, I'm trying to get someone else to come and see you. And this really reflects how ill many of these patients are. So, you know, people with BDD think they look ugly or deformed or abnormal, but they really don't. And it, it, it is often a, a quite debilitating disorder. It's, uh, these patients suffer tremendously. They're often very functionally impaired. Many of them are highly suicidal. Um, and we don't have much data on completed suicide, but the completed suicide rate appears to be very high. Um, one of the problems with BDD is it usually goes under-recognized, um, even though it's common and, and often quite severe. Uh, the good news is that we've got some very effective treatments. Now, most patients don't receive them, but they're available. Uh, so I will talk about all of this today. I'll give you an overview of BDD, its definition, prevalence, key clinical features. I have a brief video of two patients to show you. Um, I'll talk a, a good amount um, about treatment, how to diagnose BDD, and I'll, I'll say a bit about what we're learning about what, what might be causing BDD, or at least what's going on in the brains of people uh, with BDD, and, and why do they see themselves in such a distorted way. So first, my disclosures. And I'm going to start with the diagnostic criteria. So BDD is in the chapter of obsessive compulsive and related disorders in DSM-5, new chapter to DSM-5. And these are patients who are preoccupied with one or more perceived defects or flaws in physical appearance that are not observable or appear only slight to others. So they think that their flaws are 
clearly visible to others and that they look clearly abnormal, but the reality is they don't. So when these patients walk into your office, you, you cannot tell by looking at them what their concern is going to be. Now, sometimes they, when they point it out, they say, can't you see my nostrils are a little asymmetrical? And if you look closely, you might see that. Um, and, but it's not anything that was obvious until it was pointed out. And sometimes you can't see at all what they seem to see. Criterion B, at some point during the course of the disorder, the individual has performed repetitive behaviors such as excessive mirror checking, excessive grooming, skin picking, reassurance seeking. And sometimes these repetitive behaviors are mental acts, most often comparing their appearance with that of others. And these uh, behaviors occur in response to the appearance concerns. Like many uh, disorders in DSM, uh, we have the so-called clinical significance criterion where the preoccupation must cause clinically significant distress or impairment in functioning. That's to help us differentiate DDD uh, from more very quite typical uh, dissatisfaction with appearance. And also preoccupation helps with that differentiation between BDD and normal concerns. And then criterion B basically says that if someone is worried only that they, parts of their body are too fat or that they weigh too much, and if they have, they meet diagnostic criteria for an eating disorder, we, ignite, we would diagnose the eating disorder, not BDD. So the eating disorder diagnosis trumps that of BDD, but these disorders can co-occur. Um, uh, so someone may, for example, think they're too fat, but weigh 70 pounds as an adult, uh, but also be obsessed about you know, the shape of her nose and have uh, both disorders. Those patients are more challenging to treat. Then once you have made the diagnosis, you address the specifiers. So you specify whether this is the muscle dysmorphia form of, P of BDD. So these are people, almost always men, who are preoccupied with what they see as small or insufficiently muscular body build. Now remember, they have BDD, so they look normal. Some of them actually look extremely muscular uh, because many of them work out excessively. Um, somewhere between 20 to 40% of them abuse potentially dangerous anabolic steroids, which uh, do build muscle and can also have many adverse psychiatric and medical effects. And you've probably heard of roid rage. You know, some of these men can get very irritable and angry, throw a brick through a window, things like that. Some of them can present with a manic-like picture. Sometimes when they're coming off the steroids, they can become quite depressed. And the, the, these substances are not limited to steroids. Uh, I've seen patients who've been taking literally 50 prescription meds, which, just they, which they buy online without a prescription, or supplements like insulin, growth hormone, thyroid hormone, et cetera, all uh, to try to become more muscular and more lean as well. So these patients, I think, are particularly challenging to treat. We also specify level of insight. We also do that for OCD and for hoarding disorder, which are also in, in, in the same chapter with BDD. Um, and so an example of a BDD belief is I look ugly, and you can see these different levels of insight. Now, one of the big challenges with BDD is that prior to treatment, most of them have poor or absent insight, so they think they probably or definitely do look abnormal or ugly or deformed in some way, when the reality is they look normal or even quite attractive. Um, there's also the panic attack specifier, which you can use for any diagnosis in DSM that triggers panic attacks. So for B BDD, maybe this occurs in 25, 30% of patients, and the most common triggers of full-fledged panic attacks in BDD are looking in the mirror and being panicked by what they see. Uh, they do see themselves in a distorted way, uh, being under bright light because they think that makes their flaws even more visible, um, or being around other people. And, and often they think other people are taking special notice of them in a negative way because of how they look. So in this case, you would not diagnose uh, panic disorder, you would diagnose BDD with panic attack specifier. You could do that for OCD, for example, of being uh, exposed to germs uh, and someone with contamination fears triggered full-fledged panic attacks. So BDD is pretty common. Um, we've got five nationwide population-based studies showing a current prevalence of close to two to close to three percent. So that makes it more common than, than OCD and, and certainly anorexia or schizophrenia. 
And um, you can see uh, rates in, in inpatient psychiatry settings. And it makes sense that, that you know, pretty high proportion of patients, um, although not the majority um, of those who seek cosmetic procedures have BDD. And here you can see data from weighted, that are weighted means or from meta-analyses. Um, makes sense, they think they look abnormal, that they have a physical problem, insights ab uh, often absent or poor, and so they often do seek uh, cosmetic treatment, which is a problem because as I'll discuss later, it almost never works and it can make symptoms worse. Now, I just do wanna go back to the inpatient number because I know you treat inpatients and you know studies have found that only about 15% of patients hospitalized on an inpatient unit with BDD disclose their symptoms to their providers, about 15%. So it is almost always missed on inpatient settings, in, in, in patients and, and other settings as well. Many studies have found that BDD usually goes undiagnosed and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, it's important to be aware that, you know, they might be, these patients might be on, you're in your partial hospital or inpatient settings because they often are quite suicidal and ill. And uh, some data um, I just saw, it's about to be published, found this was data from a very large sample in a, in a partial hospital setting, which found that patients with BDD were more likely to be transferred from partial hospital to inpatient than patients with any other diagnosis, including major depression, PTSD, OCD, et cetera. So speaks to how ill these patients can be. Now, a number of these uh, epidemiologic nationwide studies looked at demographic and clinical correlates of BDD. So B patients with BDD compared to those without BDD um, tended to have a younger age, slight female preponderance, about 60% are female, and th they were more likely to be divorced uh, or in a committed relationship, lower income, less education, more unemployment, more sick days, more depression, anxiety, or somatoform symptoms, and importantly, greater suicidality. And one of these studies found that 31% had had suicidal ideation due to BDD and more than 20% had attempted suicide due to BDD. Now, given that these numbers are coming from a general population, these are very high. You know, we'd expect higher numbers in clinical settings, which pulls for, uh, draws patients who are more severely ill and more likely to be suicidal. But I think these numbers are very high for a population-based uh, setting. So some key clinical features. Um, this disorder most often begins at 12 or 13, and two-thirds of patients have onset of BDD, full-fledged BDD, before age 18. So it's a disorder that usually starts during childhood or adolescence. And as you've heard, you know, these patients have distressing preoccupations about perceived appearance defects that can involve any body area, often the face or head, and like OCD, the preoccupations and rituals are difficult to control. Like OCD, they're time consuming. Average three to eight hours a day for the preoccupations and for the repetitive behaviors, the rituals. Some differences from OCD with which BDD is often confused. And that's a problem, especially when you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but some differences is that BDD patients are much more likely to have prominent social anxiety and social avoidance because they think they look abnormal and that people may be making fun of them or laughing at them or at least noticing them. And so it often makes them reluctant to go out and be around people. Insight, as I mentioned, is usually absent or poor. That differs from OCD, as I'll show you in a minute. And BDD-related ideas or delusions of reference are common. So a majority at some point during the course of the illness, I think that other people are taking special notice of them in a negative way because of how they look, maybe talking about them or whispering or laughing at them. So if they walk by a couple of people sitting on a park bench having a conversation, they might think, oh, they must be talking about my jaw and how much it sticks out and how awful I look. They must be making fun of how I look. Now, I've always been interested in the insight issue because, you know, I learned early on as a clinician that um, when I started seeing these patients, it was back in the early 90s, that they often were so certain that they looked abnormal and that, that made it more difficult to engage them in, in mental health treatment because they often wanted to go and get a rhinoplasty or see a dermatologist. Um, and at the time, we didn't have 
uh, scales to measure insight in any disorders other than schizophrenia. So uh, my co good colleague Jane Eisen and I developed the Brown Assessment of Belief Scale, the BABS, to assess insight across a broad range of disorders, including BDD and OCD. And we've done a number of studies comparing insight in BDD and OCD. Um, now, an example of, of, uh, of a belief that we would assess with the BABS in BDD is, I look ugly or I look hideous. An example of an OCD belief might be, if I don't check the stove 30 times, the house will burn down. And you can see on this slide, here's total score on the BABS, and here is one item, does the belief have a psychiatric cause? OCD is blue, BDD is red, and you can see an, a, an opposite pattern of insight in terms of total score so the, in BDD and OCD. So BDD score, BDD patients much more likely to have poor or absent insight, i.e. delusional beliefs. OCD patients much more likely to recognize that their belief is not true, even though they might worry that, worry that the house might burn down, they're much less likely to be certain. In fact, only two to 4% are certain that their belief is true. Mean insight score in OCD is in the good range, in BDD it's in the poor range. And then on this one item on the scale, you can see that patients with BDD are less likely to think that their belief has a psychiatric or psychological cause. And I think this can make it more difficult to get them into treatment, to retain them in treatment. They often are skeptical that you can help them, although you really can. And we often need motivational interviewing uh, with these patients to get them to accept the treatment that we are recommending. So here are, are the body areas of concern. Uh, the skin is most common. It can be anything about the skin, perceived acne, scarring, skin color. Often people think it's too red or too white. Uh, hair often concerns, especially in men, about going bald, even though they may have a very full head of hair, but it can be anything. The hair is too curly, too straight, uneven, could involve excessive body hair, which is more common in females than males. Nose concerns are number three, often that the nose is the wrong size or shape. And you can see a broad range of concerns. Not every body area is listed here. It really can be anything. Um, on average, over the course of the illness, they're concerned with maybe five, six, seven different body areas. Depends on the study and how the question is asked. Um, some people have just one unchanging concern. Some people are concerned about every aspect of their appearance. And then the criterion B, you may recall, uh, I, you know, comments on the compulsive repetitive behaviors. Uh, here are some of the mo most common ones. Now, camouflaging isn't necessarily repetitive. Sometimes we consider that more of a safety behavior, uh, trying to avoid anxiety by having people see them. But it can be repetitive. If someone's wearing a baseball cap pulled down over their face to cover their eyebrows and their eyes, they may, a person may adjust that many times during the day or apply and reapply makeup. Um, and the camouflaging sometimes can be unusual, it can be a clue to the presence of possible BDD. So a hat pulled down over someone's face, wearing sunglasses inside, uh, extremely heavy makeup, possible clues to the presence of BDD. And sometimes the camouflage is a little bit unusual. Um, I did see, I saw one patient who had a solid sheet of bangs that really went down to the bottom of his chin and it made it impossible for him to work or even go out of the apartment. He couldn't really see where he was going. He was trying to cover his nose, which he thought was hideous. Um, and he, the reality he was a, is that he was a very good looking guy. He'd actually had three nose jobs at the Mayo Clinic. He had a beautiful nose, but he thought it still looked horribly ugly. Um, and his therapist got him to eventually move, part the bangs a little bit so he could see where he was going. But he was willing to do that and to go out of the house only if he had a huge bandage over his nose and it also covered much of his face, which he wore for the next three years until he got better with fluoxetine. Um, but that's an example of how the camouflage is sometimes unusual and can be problematic. Um, I have a patient now who will go out of the house only with a hood pulled down, a hood over his head, like with eyes cut out. And, um, you know, so that's that's unusual as well. Comparing, uh, it, it very common, they're usually comparing with you. And if they think their ears are sticking out too much, they may be looking at your ears and typically thinking that you look very good because they, they tend to overestimate the attractiveness of others in addition to underestimating their own attractiveness. 
Mirror checking, very common. It can be any reflecting surfaces, windows, toasters, back of spoons, often, you know, just trying to check and see if they look okay. Um, it can be dangerous. I've had patients who would drive looking at themselves in the rear view mirror rather than looking at the road in the rear view mirror. Compulsive grooming behaviors, hairstyling, shaving, um, excessive makeup application. This can go on for hours a day. Questioning, which often takes the form of reassurance seeking. Do I look okay? Can you see this on my face? And typically, no matter what you say, they tend not to believe you, again, because they actually see themselves differently than others see them. And they often think, oh, it's just your professional duty to tell me I look fine or you're just being nice. So it's not helpful to get into uh, providing reassurance. It just fuels the desire to ask for more um, or, or can make patients very upset if they don't like what they hear. Compulsive skin picking, close to 40% of these patients compulsively pick their skin. Uh, remember, skin is the most common concern, and what, what they're doing is they're trying to make their skin look better, but they find it hard to stop. Is Again, it's a very driven behavior over which they don't have much control. The problem is that they may pick not only with their fingers, but with sharp things like staple removers, knives, razor blades, pins, and needles, and it can go on for a long time. So these patients can be the exception to the rule the patients with BDD look normal or those, the flaws that they perceive are just slight uh, because some of these patients do considerable damage to their skin and may have deep scarring or actual lesions on their skin, but they're not intending to self-mutilate. And if you can ascertain that this is self-inflicted, then they can still meet uh, the diagnosis, um, still meet the diagnostic criteria for BDD. Uh, this can sometimes be dangerous behavior. I've had some patients pick through the facial artery um, um, and, and have to go to the ER for sutures. I know of one patient who picked and picked at a pimple on her neck with some tweezers. She actually picked so deeply that she exposed her carotid artery and needed emergency surgery. The surgeon said if she'd been just a couple millimeters more lateral, she probably would not have survived. So occasionally quite dangerous behavior. I should mention that the skin picking in BDD is different from the skin picking in the new uh, excoriation parentheses skin picking disorder that is in DSM-5. It's in the same chapter with BDD. That disorder is more like trichotillomania. It's more purely motoric. It's more, it's just behavioral. It's not triggered by the thought, oh, this thing is ugly on my face. I have to get rid of it. It's not triggered by appearance thoughts. So if someone is a compulsive skin picker or hair puller, you need to ask, are there any thoughts that are triggering this behavior? And if the thought is something, you know, you know along the lines of their being unhappy with some perceived minimal defect in their appearance, then that's uh, compatible with BDD, not skin picking disorder or trick. And, you know, we use habit reversal training at behavioral technique, regardless of whether the skin picking is a symptom of BDD or not. But patients BDD, you've got a lot more to treat than just the skin picking. And that, you know, you need to be aware of that. Compulsive tanning, about 25% of these patients compulsively tan, uh, which of course, you know, can be dangerous and increase risk of skin cancer. And typically this is to, uh, darken what they perceive as pale skin. So impairment in BDD spans a broad spectrum from relatively mild to life-threatening, very severe. And on average, these patients are, are quite impaired. Um, we found these data are from BDD samples that don't have unusually severe BDD. It's kind of average BDD in terms of severity finding that 39% were currently not working due to mental illness, and for most BDD was the primary diagnosis. We find high rates of school dropout, being housebound for at least a week due to BDD, high rates of psychiatric hospitalization, substance use disorder, a little bit more than half of them will say that the BDD contributes at least somewhat, and often they often substantially to their substance use, it's an attempt to self-medicate their distress and their social anxiety and aggressive behavior. BDD can trigger aggressive behavior if they think that they're just angry that they're so ugly and that they can't fix it or that people won't pay for plastic surgery or when they think people are laughing at them because of how they look. And we do find that the more severe BDD symptoms are, the more severe their impairment in functioning tends to be.
Now, what I worry most about as a clinician is suicidality in these patients. Um, and we do find high lifetime rates of suicidality. Um, we find, now this is very preliminary data, large confidence interval around these numbers, but we found, have found a standardized mortality ratio of 22 for suicides that were confirmed by death certificate, up to 36 for those confirmed by death certificate and probable suicides when death certificates were not obtainable. So what this means is that the, is that the rate of completed suicide uh, compared to those, to people in the general population and adjusted for age, gender, and geographic location, all of which affect the suicide rate, the rate of completed suicide is between 22 and 36 times higher than in the general population. So just to put this in context, a large meta-analysis uh, for bipolar disorder found an S standardized mortality ratio of 15, depression 20. So um, this, these are very concerning numbers. Um, furthermore, a systematic review with meta-analysis found that BDD is characterized by significantly higher levels of suicidality than other psychiatric disorders that are characterized by high risk for suicidal thoughts and acts. Now, two subsequent studies have been done since the, this meta-analysis was published, both in a partial hospital setting, one with a large sample, they found the same thing. And greater BDD severity is associated with higher risk for suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. So I'm now gonna show you a very brief video of two patients with BDD, um, which I hope is helpful for you to see. Well, Patricia O'Neill can't stop looking in the mirror. She too is obsessed with imperfections in her skin, but has to constantly check her appearance. Mostly when I'm driving, which is the worst place to look at yourself in a mirror in the daylight in a rearview mirror. Is it true that at one point you took your father's razor blade to your face? Yeah, that's true. What were you thinking? I was thinking of, I couldn't stand the way my skin looked. I mean, I didn't dig the razor blade in. I just kind of, you know, pulled it over my skin thinking I would, you know, smooth out the texture of it. I really don't know what I was thinking. Like most people who suffer from body dysmorphic disorder, Patricia, who's 32 and single, felt too ashamed to talk about how out of control she felt. The basement studio where she works alone as a sign painter became her hideaway and the only place where she could let out her desperate feelings. I could cry there and no one could see me. I would be there and cry and cry. Because I couldn't think of how to explain it to anybody. I couldn't think of where to start. How would you describe the pain that you went through? Desperate. Totally desperate. Um, like I'd rather be dead. Like it would be easier for me to be dead. Easier for my parents and my family. I was, I was ashamed. Kathy thinks her appearance is so frightening that she agreed to be interviewed only if we promise not to use her last name and keep her in shadow. She's had body dysmorphic disorder for 20 years, and for one six-year period, hardly left her house. I was totally debilitated. I um, thought of nothing but suicide and knew that I couldn't live looking the way I looked. I stayed upstairs in my house, and I walked from um, my room to my mother's bedroom over and over till I put in like at least five to ten miles a day. And that's, that was my whole day, just walking back and forth. On the few occasions when you did go out of the house, how did you feel? I felt like a monster that everybody was looking at me, that cars would get into crashes when they saw me because I'd be too busy looking at how ugly I was. And when you looked in the mirror? My heart would sink, and I, I knew I couldn't live. I'd be heartbroken. This is Kathy's self-portrait. This is literally what she sometimes sees when she looks in the mirror. My cheeks are really flat, like just really flattened out. My face is all different colors and all different blotches, and I just feel like I'm ugly, period. How does Kathy look in reality? 
Well, this photograph at age 12 shows just how pretty she really is. It's the only photograph she has. All the others she destroyed. So I hope you could hear that video, and I, I hope that it gives you a sense of how much suffering this disorder can cause. Patricia had kind of moderate BDD. She was able to work, but needed to be in the basement and didn't want people to see her, felt so ashamed and was, you know, thought life was not worth living. Um, Kathy, the woman in shadow, was very, very severely ill. I think didn't leave her house for five to six years. Uh, she thought she was too ugly to go out. And I'm happy to say that both of these patients uh, got well with the treatments I'm gonna describe today. So I hope that what I've presented so far um, convinces you that it's important to find BDD when it's present. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, BDD is usually missed in clinical settings. Many studies have looked at this and found this to be the case. And usually to detect BDD, you have to ask specifically about BDD symptoms. So the diagnosis is usually pretty straightforward to make. It follows the diagnostic criteria and appearance concerns. You can ask questions like, are you very worried about your appearance in any way? Or are you unhappy with how you look? If yes, tell me about your concern. You need to establish preoccupation. A question I really like to ask is, how much time would you estimate you think about your appearance each day? If you add up all the time, I often say, I know it's hard to come up with this number, but just an idea. We don't have a cut point that's written in stone, but generally an hour or more a day, like OCD, is compatible with the diagnosis. Uh, they often underestimate, though, when you first ask the question, and um, you know later in the interview, you may get, get the more accurate answer. Repetitive behaviors, is there anything you feel an urge to do over and over again in response to your appearance concerns, like comparing with others, checking mirrors, and then establish the presence of clinically significant distress or impairment in functioning? Just asking about a whole broad domain, you know, a broad range of domains of, of functioning. I'd like to say just a bit about ED, possible etiology pathophysiology, and I've got question marks here because, of course, we don't really know. Most studies are cross-sectional and we don't have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, confirmation in replication studies, but in some areas we do. But almost certainly, like other psychiatric disorders, BDD is multifactorial. It's not vanity. It's not just uh, due to society's pressures <laughs> for people to look good, although that probably plays a role. But it does look as though BDD has a neurobiological basis like other uh, psychiatric disorders. And there are some nice big twin studies from Sweden and uh, showing that genetics, uh, genetic vulnerability probably accounts for 37 to 49% of the variants of dysmorphic concern, which is very similar to the diagnosis of BDD. And we know from these twin studies that there's shared genetic vulnerability with OCD plus BDD specific genetic influences, which is such a, just a great finding because BDD has so much in common with OCD and yet we know in important ways it's different. You know, more suicidality, more depression, more substance abuse, more social anxiety, poor insight. Um, we have just a few small candidate gene studies uh, you know, sharing, showing possible involvement of uh, these genes, but uh, again, we need replication of these findings. Uh, there are abnormalities in corticostradal circuitry. I'll show you that on the next slide, like OCD. Several studies of white matter in BDD showing uh, one study found widespread compromised white matter integrity suggesting that there's reduced organization of white, white matter in the brain and inefficient connections between different areas of the brain, which may have something to do with why they're just not seeing themselves quite right or integrating what they're seeing uh, uh, with, with air emotional reactions. Perceptual visual processing abnormalities. Now, this is the best studied endophenotype. I'll have more to say about that um, on subsequent slides, but they seem to over-focus on detail and have difficulty seeing the big picture. Again, that fits with what we see clinically where they're focusing on tiny little things, aspects of their appearance that we can't see or can barely see. Cognitive and emotional functioning, multiple deficits and biases. I'll show you this on a subsequent slide and possibly evolutionary factors. This disorder usually starts at puberty, may have to be, uh, be related to uh, uh, feeling a need to be 
fit, quote unquote, as a mate. Uh, we know, for example, that in the animal world, greater symmetry of moth wings, for example, signifies greater uh, health and reproductive fitness. It may be that spots on the face signify illness and thus, thus let, uh, less reproductive fitness. These are theories, but something to think about. So, uh, certainly environmental factors are important, broadly defined, because genetics is accounting for only part of the variants. So we have somewhat limited data, uh, but suggesting that perceived childhood neglect and abuse, not confirmed, but several studies have found this, one showing it's more common in BDD than in OCD, uh, high rates of perceived teasing, being teased and bullied, that kind of makes sense that you might end up feeling badly about yourself, and it's teasing about competence and appearance. One study, in one study we found reports of low parental warmth and, of course, sociocultural pressures almost un undoubtedly play some role. And then I separate out temperament and personality since that's both sort of neurobiologically and environmentally determined, but we do find high levels of neuroticism, high levels of introversion, high levels of rejection sensitivity, both appearance specific and general rejection sensitivity and heightened aesthetic sensitivity. So, you know, if you take all of these into account, you would see how they might possibly increase risk or lead to BDD. So the best studied endophenotype is aberrant visual processing in BDD. And a couple studies here, they're really groundbreaking, um, which show that, that people with BDD compared to healthy controls actually see faces differently. Uh, they overfocus on tiny details of what they are seeing, um, and they have difficulty seeing the big picture. This, uh, this uh, picture up here shows BDD patients compared to healthy controls when they're looking at fuzzy faces while in an fMRI scanner. And what this shows is that compared to healthy controls, those with BDD have hyperactivity, excess brain activation in areas of the brain that are specialized for seeing detail. So they're looking at fuzzy faces and their brains are trying to extract detail even when there isn't any to be seen. And then what this, uh, the second uh, picture shows down here um, is hypoactivity in occipital lobe when they're looking at low spatial frequency pictures of, of faces. So you know, they're, they're again looking at fuzzy faces and this can happen when they're looking at unaltered photos also. Their brains seem to be underactive and have difficulty seeing the big picture. So they have trouble recognizing the details are just details. Details to them are magnified and um, it fits with what they tell us about what they are seeing. Uh, these abnormalities are similar but not identical to those in anorexia nervosa. In fact, one study that compared the two groups found that the visual processing aberrations were more severe in BDD than in anorexia. And when looking at their own face, the orbital frontal co uh, cortex here and the caudate here are, are overactive, like OCD, probably reflecting obsessive BDD thoughts and rituals. Now, a question people often ask is, does this aberrant visual processing extend to non-faces? What about other objects? And yes, it does. So the bias for encoding and analyzing details of visual stimuli and reduced visual processing of holistic or big picture information extends beyond faces to houses, complex figures. If they have to draw the Rayostreth complex figure from memory, they don't do a very good job because they have focused in on the details, like you see over here, not the big configural elements. So they have trouble then reconstructing it. They also have what's called a reduced inversion effect when they're looking at upside down faces on a computer. So when we're very quickly shown upright faces on a computer, we quickly recognize that they're upright faces because our brains have a template for upright faces. This is evolutionarily advantageous to recognize that something called coming towards you as an upright face. We don't have a template for upside down faces because we're not hanging down upside down from trees and it's not necessary for us to recognize that upside down faces are faces. So it's, it takes us longer to recognize that. But patients with BDD recognize the, them as faces much more quickly, probably because they're so good at seeing detail. So you can see here the upright faces 
Um, and then the, the upside down faces, which to me look like horseshoes with tiny dots on them, but they're fa upside down faces. And again, the patients with BDD um, are, are, are quicker to recognize that those are faces reflecting their focus on detail. And then I mentioned aberrant cognitive and emotional processing. These are just some of the findings that have indicated executive dysfunction and memory deficits, a bias towards appearance related cues and negatively evaluated body parts. Eye tracking studies show that when they look at photos or themselves, they zero in on disliked body areas. And then they have a tendency to misidentify neutral facial expressions as angry or disgusted, um, as contemptuous and angry, and they tend to misinterpret neutral scenarios, both social and appearance related scenarios as threatening. So this may all explain why, or, or at least is consistent with why uh, we find that they often have um, ideas or delusions of reference, thinking that other people are making fun of them or staring at them or laughing at them when that's not actually the case. And when you are with these patients, you have to remember to smile a fair amount because they may be misperceiving your facial expression. So I want to switch gears um, and, and talk about treatment. So this is, this is so common in patients with BDD. Three quarters seek and two thirds receive cosmetic treatment uh, for their BDD symptoms. Dermatologic is most common, fitting with our findings at skin and hair concerns are the most common concerns, surgery, quite common. Other medical, they might, for example, see an endocrinologist because they think they have too much body or facial hair. Dentists, because BDD can affect the teeth. And then uh, paraprofessionals, things like getting electrolysis for perceived excessive facial hair or bushy eyebrows or something like that. And I'm going to show you some treatment data, some prospective, mostly retrospective, from 890 treatments that I collected data on. And you'll see that in most cases, the cosmetic treatment le leads patients to say, oh, I look the same, it didn't help. Um, now, some will say the treated body part looks better, but it's only rarely that overall BDD gets better. So the reason for that difference is, um, you know, they often have more than one concern. So if they get a rhinoplasty, they may still have eight other concerns. And so their overall BDD may not be any better. But in maybe 30 to 50% of cases, they actually switch to a different body part. Um, so as one patient said, you know, after my nose job, I thought my nose looked a little bit better, but then my stomach took over for my nose. Um, and this kind of makes sense because again, BDD isn't a problem with how the person actually looks. It's distorted body image and a tendency to obsess um, about minor or non-existent flaws. And there are endless things we could obsess about on ourselves if we wanted to. So. Uh, I think this finding makes makes sense. And then in a small proportion of cases, you'll see that uh, they actually get worse. I think one of the things that's quite concerning about, about BDD is um, what cosmetic surgeons and dermatologists have reported. So uh, in two different studies, they were asked, um, have you ever treated a patient with BDD and what happened? And you'll see here that both the surgeons and the dermatologists say, many of them say the patient was more preoccupied after the treatment they provided. Many of them say they now have a new perceived defect. Some say they're less preoccupied, but almost none say that they are free of their preoccupation. And then I think very concerning is the percentage who report that they've been threatened by one of these patients, especially the surgeons. 40% of the surgeons report that they have been legally, physically, or both legally and physically threatened by a patient with BDD. There are reported murders of uh, plastic surgeons, um, probably by patients who had BDD. Uh, when I was giving some talks in Australia, in Sydney, Australia, while I was there, um, I heard about a surgeon who was had just been viciously stabbed by a patient with BDD. So. Um, these patients um, are a potential threat to those who provide cosmetic treatment, unfortunately. And in fact, um, the American Academy of Otolaryngology put out a practice guideline saying you shouldn't operate on these patients. In fact, they say BDD is a contraindication to elective rhinoplasty and surgery should be strongly discouraged. 
um, the American College of OBGYN has said something similar for breast or labia surgery. So we want to make sure that as mental health professionals, we are not, uh, we're kind of, we're discouraging patients uh, from these treatments. Now, fortunately, we have much more effective treatments. And as with all patients, you need to set some groundwork for treatment. This may take longer than, you, than for other patients when you're treating someone with BDD. As always, we express empathy and hope and have to really attend to the therapeutic alliance. Many are ambivalent about treatment. I think you're more likely to need motivational interviewing than you need for many other patients. Again, they think they look ugly. They often think they can't, that you can't help them. Many of the patients I see are dragged to treatment by somebody else. It's often adolescent young adult whose parents are really making them come to see me because um, the adolescent or the young adult isn't willing because they don't think this is a psychiatric problem. It does, you know, it takes more time to provide psychoeducation. I think what's wonderful about the translational research findings that I've described is we can actually discuss them with our patients in a helpful way. So you can say to the patient, you know, that we have scientists have found that patients with BDD actually tend to see themselves differently than others do. And the, they, they, you know, their brains are working too hard to see detail and it's hard for their brains to contextualize the detail and see that it's just tiny detail, uh, that they may be, you know, misperceiving the expressions of others as more negative than they actually are. Um, this is more helpful than saying you look fine or you look very pretty because that tends not to work. Um, uh, you know, especially if they have delusional beliefs, that's, you can't, it's very hard to talk someone out of a delusional belief. You can also, of course, focus on their suffering and preoccupation, effective symptoms on their lives, because that's something they can typically agree with you about. And that's a way to join with them and, and try and encourage them to accept treatment. You do want to discourage cosmetic treatment and involve family members uh, if potentially helpful. Now, the SRIs are our first line medication for BDD. Um, early case series suggested that they were often effective and more effective than other medications. That led to some rigorous open label trials uh, showing high response rates. And these are intention to treat analyses. So these include dropouts along the way. If you, if you only analyze the data for those who complete the full trial, the response rates are even higher than this. And then we have a controlled crossover trial showing that the SRI clomipramine was more efficacious than the non-SRI antidepressant dizipramine, so like OCD. A placebo-controlled trial showing fluoxetine is more efficacious than placebo. And a placebo-controlled relapse prevention trial showing that the SRI escitalopram was more effective in, present, in preventing relapse among those who had responded to it than placebo over a six-month period. And I'll just briefly show you the data from uh, these, these three studies. So here's the study of fluoxetine versus placebo and in a 12-week trial. And what tends to get better with medication is they don't obsess as much and the urges to check uh, to check and do all the other rituals diminish. They have more control over their thoughts, over their behaviors. Their suffering diminishes. They get less depressed. It's easier to go out and be around other people. Functioning often improves um, and uh, 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 insight often improves as well. Not always, but often. I've always been interested in, in how do we get the patients with delusional beliefs to get better because typically we would use neuroleptics for that right, often neuroleptic monotherapy. But, you know, all the studies that have looked at this, uh, most of the treatment, most of the, the, the med trials have, have found that those with delusional beliefs are just as likely to respond to SRI monotherapy as those with non-delusional beliefs. So that was true in this study. You see almost the same response rate. Um, and that's, that's been true in every study that, that has looked at this. So that's a very interesting finding, right? That we would treat a delusional belief potentially with SRI monotherapy. Sometimes we do add in an, an atypical antipsychotic, which I'll talk about shortly. And here's this very nice clomipramine versus dizipramine crossover trial. Patients were first treated with one, then blindly crossed over to the other. And overall, you can see these response rates and the greater efficacy of clomipramine was also consistent with case series data uh, suggesting greater efficacy for this not for um, this SRI than this non-SRI. So again, much like the treatment of OCD in terms of the medication treatment. 
And then we uh, more recently did a relapse prevention trial in which we prospectively examined relapse risk after discontinuation of efficacious medications. So there were two phases. In phase one, we treated 100 patients with 14 weeks of open-label escitalopram, uh, mean dose of 26 uh, and up to 30 milligrams a day. And then in phase two, we took the responders to the medication in phase one, and we randomized them to continue medication with escitalopram or switched them over to placebo and followed them for six months. So here you see phase one, and you can see the uh, response rates uh, for all randomized participants. And then 81% responded uh, after 14 weeks if they completed the full trial. And then, as I mentioned, we took the responders, randomized them to continue medication or be switched over to placebo. And here's the point of randomization. Uh, we followed them over six months. And you can see that over time, there was significantly longer time to relapse for those who continued on the escitalopram, shown in blue, than those on placebo, shown in red. In terms of relapse proportions, 18%. Uh, relapsed on escitalopram, which actually is higher than I see in my clinical practice, uh, and 40% relapsed on placebo. And then when we look at those uh, who were treated with escitalopram for these for the six-month follow-up, um, we found that uh, more than a third of them had further improvement from months, uh, you know, three plus to nine, and that relapse uh, was much less common than further improvement. So the SRIs are the first-line medication for BDD, uh, both delusional, de non-delusional, and delusional absent insight BDD. You must use a high enough dose in a total trial duration of 12 to 14, occasionally 16 weeks, to determine response. And this is so important. And most patients don't receive adequate first-line pharmacotherapy. Um, I found in one study that only third, this was a 200 uh, participants, I think, we found only uh, of those who'd received SRIs, and maybe mo many of them had, only 13% of lifetime SRI trials were optimal for BDD, only 22% were minimally adequate, and those with optimal or at least minimally adequate uh, SRI trials, that was associated with greater improvement. This was an observational study, not a randomized trial, but um, we found that association. And high SRI doses are often needed, sometimes over the FDA maximum. I do it all the time. But I don't do it for clomipramine being a tricyclic and a lower therapeutic index. I do not exceed 250. And I don't exceed the newer uh, limit of 40 for citalopram. I just feel that that limit seems a little firmer than for the other SSRIs. But so I don't use it anymore for that reason. But of course, we have escitalopram, which is almost the same. So fortunately. I'm going to show you doses on the next slide. I think you, you know, some people find them a little shocking, but I just want to remind you that they are the same as the maximum SRI doses in the APA practice guideline for OCD. So in some way, officially sanctioned, at least for OCD. And we don't have any prospective dose finding studies where we randomize people to 20 versus 40 versus 60 of fluoxetine, for example. But we did find that higher SRI doses were more efficacious than lower doses in a retrospective study. So what this slide shows is maximum dose used for BDD in black. Again, same as maximum for OCD in that practice, OCD practice guide. Now you can see they're pretty high compared to the FDA maximum. Again, I don't exceed the 250 for clomipramine, and, and I check blood levels also. Um, and um, I no longer exceed this for citalopram. Here are the average doses that I use in my practice. Here are two different samples. I guess more recently I've been using higher escitalopram doses. This is the SRI for which you most often have to exceed the FDA max because that maximum of 20 is just very low relative to the other SRIs. Um, I do get an EKG at doses above 30 a day just to be cautious. I've never seen a problem. Fluoxetine has the advantage of being the one where you least often have to exceed the FDA max. Um, that can be an advantage from an insurance perspective. Um, and then these are dose, this is the average dose I used to use for citalopram. I think with this newer limit, I just don't use it anymore. Um, so what I try to what I do is I try to reach the FDA maximum, but 30 for escitalopram, not not the, I don't stop at the 20. That's typically too low. Within six to ten weeks, if tolerated, unless a lower dose is effective. 
Um, comipramine doses, dosing is guided by blood levels. I check EKGs. I mentioned checking uh, for escitalopram. And if there's no response or only a partial response to an SRI after 12 to 14 weeks, including at least three to four weeks at the FDA max, if tolerated, and if they're not better at a lower dose, but 30 for escitalopram, again, I don't stop at the 20, and this would be the same as for OCD. You can consider increasing the dose above the FDA max. My first choice, except for those two. You could augment the SRI, um, or you could switch. So I, I tend to go above the FDA max, but you know, I also often will augment. And um, I think neuroleptics, antipsychotics, increasingly called mental health medications, because um, they're so broad in terms of their efficacy. You'll see the studies here, not a lot of data. Um, I did a study of uh, the old typical antipsychotic pimazide for various reasons. I chose that medication. Uh, added it to Prozac, uh, added Pimazide versus placebo to Prozac for patients who'd not uh, responded to an adequate Prozac trial. It was a very negative study. We have a few chart review studies with equivocal results. No studies for atypicals, unfortunately. But um, these are what I'm using um, because I often see really excellent outcomes for many patients and especially those who have quite severe depression. So. Or is my first choice. I often use lorazidone. And I often add it before an SRI trial is adequate. If there's very severe depression, if I'm really worried about safety, um, you can see really very nice results when adding these meds. But I think more often I'd go for a full SRI trial first and then can add this if necessary. Um, Buspar, I, you know, some case series data, I still use it. And I, you know, I lean a bit towards Buspar augmentation if there's more prominent anxiety, more towards something like aripiprazole or lorazidone if there's more severe depression. And then we have no data on glutamate modulators in BDD. There's some small promising studies in OCD, but I, I'm increasingly using NAC up to 24 to 3600 milligrams a day. Uh, non-prescription supplement. I recommend the Swanson brand. Uh, you do need to make sure it's of high quality because it's a supplement and memantine a prescription med. Um, both can be helpful. Um, and again, no data, but very little downside, especially to adding the NAC to an SRI. Sorry, the slide is having an issue. All right, SRI alternatives. You can switch to another SRI next. That would be my first choice. You can try clomipramine if several SSRIs haven't helped as it's a bit different from the others. There are small positive open label trials for venlafaxine and for levetiracetam, um, uh, an anti-epileptic. Um, no data on duloxetine or velazidone. I've certainly seen them, seen them help patients. I wouldn't recommend any of these as first line treatment just because we don't have as much data as for the SRIs, but something to consider and 12-week trials for all of them. So uh, finally, I just want to uh, talk a bit about behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy for BDD, which is the psychosocial treatment of choice. It must be tailored to BDD's unique symptoms. Some of the treatment elements do overlap with OCD, but I think if you treat BDD as if it is OCD, the treatment typically does not go very well. Um, and efficacy of CBT has been shown versus a waiting list, multiple wait list studies, versus anxiety management, online supportive therapy, and therapist delivered supportive therapy. So a really growing number of well done studies. Most patients need at least six months of weekly treatment, but some need way more than that. And sometimes we do very intensive CBT, you know, many, many hours a week. I do recommend use of an evidence-based uh, BDD-specific treatment manual because I do think it, it can go wrong with this treatment. It's, it's, it, it, they can be challenging to treat, especially the more severely ill patients. And there are two published evidence-based treatment manuals for BDD based on some of the studies on the prior slide. I just want to tell you a bit about this study that, that we recently published. It's uh, the first study to compare uh, therapist delivered CBT to therapist delivered supportive therapy, which is the most frequently received therapy for BDD. Um, I did the study when I was at Brown and uh, with uh, Sabina Wilhelm at, at MGH, and we randomized 120 adults to 24 weeks of weekly CBT or enhanced 
supportive therapy, meaning we added some psycho ed about BDD at the beginning. We had some, uh, we had included three and six month assessment follow assessments. We used our manualized treatment and we did all kinds of th things you do to ensure good fidelity, you know, integrator reliability and the therapists are adhering to the treatment that they were um, providing and were delivering it competently. And our findings were not exactly what we had ex expected, sort of and sort of not. Um, so this slide shows that the difference between CBT for BDD and supportive psychotherapy was site specific. So treatments were comparable at one site. You see down here, but uh, CBT was much more efficacious at the other site. You can see here that supportive therapy didn't do so well uh, when we're looking at total score. Um, and CBT did improve, so I think we can conclude that CBT improved BDD severity and also quality of life more consistently across sites and the gains were maintained in both groups over six months of follow-up. Now we have puzzled over this, you know, why, why were there different, why were, why did supportive, CBT perform very well at both sites, why did supportive therapy perform well at one site but not the other? One may be that Mass General has, you know, a training program in supportive and psychodynamic supportive therapy, and uh, they're kind of known for how good they are in that. So, um, whereas I think the therapists at my site were just very good, but you know, not not um, uh, highly specialized in in the treatment. Um, although we we tried to avoid over specialization, but I think the the environment at Mass General was just kind of in the in the water. You know, they're they're good at this. At supportive therapy. And, but it also kind of makes sense that outcomes with supportive therapy might be a little more variable than with CBT because CBT is very prescriptive. It's, you know, a very highly structured treatment. Supportive therapy is, you know, much less structured and probably um, varies depending on the, the alliance, the style of the therapist, probably more dependent on therapist specific factors and the fit with the patient. So in some ways, these findings make sense that you would see greater variability with supportive than with uh, CBT. Uh, we're just now uh, writing up a paper in, we're in which we're looking at remission, uh, full or partial remission, not meeting full BDD criteria anymore, finding that CBT uh, was associated with significantly higher remission rates uh, at post-treatment and also significantly higher sustained remission rates over the six month uh, follow-up period. And here just to show you the completer uh, response rates. So what do we do in CBT? Well, we do a fair amount of psychoeducation, case formulation. We build a model of the patient's symptoms to try to help them understand how the strategies that they're going to learn are going to help their specific symptoms. This is one thing you can do to uh, enhance the credibility of the treatment. We have found that higher credibility of the treatment predicts better outcome. It kind of makes sense. So that CBT model and good psychoeducation is, it, are two ways you can enhance the credibility of the treatment. Remember, many patients think, oh, this is going to be a waste of my time. I really need a rhinoplasty. Uh, so enhancing credibility is important. We do cognitive restructuring, just kind of standard cognitive restructuring, where we identify unrealistic negative thoughts about appearance and help them learn all the different cognitive errors and help them develop more accurate and helpful beliefs. So an example might be, you know, I look hideous. Everyone's going to laugh at me if, we, if I go to that party tonight. And we would identify fortune telling and catastrophizing and mind reading and emotional reasoning, et cetera. And an alternative thought might be, you know, I can't, I can't predict the future. I don't know what people are going to be thinking, and I can't read minds. And, you know, my my friends are always really happy to see me. And the last time I did something like this, it went better than I thought. So, you know, come up with all kinds of rational responses. Um, uh, uh, exposure, having them gradually face feared and avoided situations. Uh, which are usually social situations. We include behavioral experiments to test their belief. We want to make those pretty specific. If, if the prediction is people are going to look at me when I go out, if only one person looks at them, they may come back and say, see people were looking at me. All right, so we want to make it very specific. So for example, if you walk down a kind of busy sidewalk 
they might predict that at least 70% of people will, as, the per as they're approaching the patient, look at them at least briefly with a look of horror and cross over to the other side of the street because they don't want to get so close to an ugly person. Um, you might wonder why doesn't the patient know this isn't happening? Well, they may not be going out or they may only be going, they may be going out and looking down or kind of with their hair over their eyes. So when you make it very specific, like with distances and percentages, then um, they come back and talk about whether the feared outcome happened. And of course it doesn't. And um, they need to learn that, you know, for themselves. And you help them learn that by asking them what they learned during the exposure. We don't push the exposures as fast or as hard as we do in OCD. Um, the exposures are very tough for these patients and we prepare them by doing cognitive restructuring first and training, teaching them to do that. We do ritual prevention, which is typical to what you would typical for OCD, you know, get them to cut back on the time they spend, delay rituals, eventually stop uh, doing them. Stimulus control, for example, getting rid of tweezers that they use to pick their skin, try to get them to spend less time on social media, things like this if they're doing a lot of comparing, which they often are. A lot of writing in, in CBT, especially as they're learning it. It's very important to fill out all these forms, not just try and do it in their head. Um, we also do some perceptual retraining. We incorporate it with some mindfulness. These are very brief mirror exercises where they learn to see their body non-judgmentally and holistically. In other words, their entire body without focusing on details. And we model this for them. We start at the top of our head and briefly describe our body from head to toe in very neutral terms. You know, I have dark brown hair that's parted on the side and it's about down to the middle of my neck and, you know, it's straight and uh, my face is kind of oval and you just kind of go down and briefly describe yourself. And, and the goal here is to avoid negative self-talk, which is usually what's going on in their heads when they're looking at themselves and avoid having them just get stuck on what they don't like. And of course, no rituals. This is not staring in the mirror. This is not, you know, trying to become habituated to their anxiety by staring in the mirror. We discourage that. That's a ritual, right? Mirror checking and mirror staring. And the worry is that that mirror staring, at, staring at the things they don't like might actually worsen their perceptual distortions. We don't know that for a fact, but it makes sense. If you stare at tiny details, you might be training your brain to become even more sensitive to tiny details. So. No excessive mirror checking, no staring. This is a quick, uh, quick once or twice a day, five minute exercise. We do advanced cognitive strategies. We work on self-esteem. We try and modify their deeper level negative core beliefs, which are often things like I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, I'll always be alone. So, you know, no wonder they often um, are, are suicidal. Um, and, and motivational interviewing, as I said, many patients need this at the beginning or during treatment and then relapse prevention, prepare for the end of treatment. And I often offer patients booster sessions. I think we go down to once a month or every couple months just to check in and brush up their skills. We have some optional CBT approaches, habit reversal training, which we would use for trichotillomania or skin picking disorder. And this is if they have compulsive skin picking or hair plucking as symptoms of BDD. Uh, we have a weight, shape, and muscularity uh, module for the muscle dysmorphics or for women who, you know, who are worried about weight or shape. Um, cosmetic treatment, treatment module for patients receiving or planning cosmetic treatment. And one goal is to try and get them, if they won't agree to never get it, to at least delay it um, until after uh, they try the treatments that we know are very, very likely uh, to help. And I had one patient who was about 25 and she'd already had 25 plastic surgeries or so. And she wanted to know about another 25 more, but we got her to agree to delay it for six months. And then we, of course, treated her <laughs> and then with our treatments. And then, uh, you know, at six months, we'd say, well, she wasn't quite entirely well. Would you be willing to delay for another six months? And she was. And so eventually she got really well, and never had any more surgery. And once these patients are well, they usually don't want it. They're often quite depressed, so you know we do have a module in our in our a manual for uh, activity scheduling, behavioral activation, which often I do early in the treatment, um, especially if patients are very depressed, sitting around having nothing to do, which of course is worse during COVID. Um, unstructured time is very bad if you have BDD because people tend to do their rituals and they tend to get more depressed and go to bed, lie in bed, and so I think often doing this early in the treatment is is helpful. So the one last thing is I just like to mention some 
unfortunately fairly common treatment challenges. I've, I've pretty much covered all of this, but just to put it on one slide and just remind you, poor absent BDD related insight and low motivation is, is common. You want to use psychoeducation, motivational interviewing, and again, enhanced credibility. Now, two studies have found higher treatment credibility predicts better outcome with CBT. Um, cosmetic, and of course, we can tell patients that the medications are so often helpful. You know, the odds are good they'll get better if they get a good trial. Cosmetic treatment, that's another challenge. Sought by most, but almost never helpful, can worsen BDD symptoms and encourage psychiatric treatment instead. You can try that delay strategy. Um, sometimes you have to get family involved and have them agree not to pay for these treatments. Substance use disorders are common. Depending on the study, you know, 30, 40, 50% have a lifetime substance use disorder, often in response to BDD. So often you have to treat the substance abuse as well as the BDD. I tend to treat them concurrently. One can make the other worse. Um, aggression and violence. You're going to see this in some of these patients and uh, more common in adolescents and those with a substance use disorder need medication, need therapy. And suicidality, of course, you need to monitor that, use medication. I'm much more likely to add in an atypical like aripiprazole. And then this manual, if you're not familiar with, is a wonderful treatment manual for suicidal patients. There are others out there as well, but this is a very nice one. So in summary, BDD is common, but very under-recognized. Um, suicidality rates appear very high and psychosocial function and quality of life are typically very poor. We have this very interesting emerging data suggesting that visual processing, corticosteroidal circuitry, white matter integrity, executive functioning, cognitive and emotional processing and certain types of life events are relevant to BDD. And it's so great that we can use some of this emerging data to help explain BDD to patients and help them agree to let us work with them. And then SRIs, often at high doses, and not always, but often those mean doses, as you can see, tend to be pretty high, and CBT tailored specifically to BDD are the currently recommended treatments for both delusional and non-delusional BDD and are often efficacious. So I hope you'll look for BDD in your practice. These patients are out there. Look for some of the clues. And if you find it, great. You saw the diagnosis was really pretty straightforward in most cases. So I hope, hope you'll look for BDD and, and, and try these treatments. And it's just so incredibly gratifying when these patients get better, which most of, most of them will. So thank you and um, be happy to hand it over uh, 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 to uh, Dr. Garakani. I'm no longer muted. Okay. Uh, so uh, I wanted to um, go over some questions. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. That was an excellent talk. I just want to say one thing. I took care of one of Dr. Phillips' patients um, Thank you. years ago. And when the patient came in, he was on 60 milligrams of Lexapro. I'd never seen a patient on that much Lexapro. <laughs> and I remember calling her and she said, no, 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 it's, it's, not, uh, it's not out of the ordinary. And uh, she gave me a really wonderful background on uh, BDD. And I learned a lot from, from taking care of her patient here. So it was, it was quite an education. Um, these are really challenging patients. Uh, let me start with a question. One of them is from our, one of our own doctors here. And, and he asked, um, has brain activation and fMRI studies been shown to normalize with SSRI treatment? Wow. Great question. No one has done that study, but you know that has been shown for depression, for OCD in terms of the orbital frontal uh, caudate hyperactivity. So I suspect it would be the same for BDD, but we don't know. I hope, I hope, I hope that study gets done someday. Well, I'm sure you're going to do it. <laughs> uh, and one of the other questions, there are a couple of questions that I wanted to get to about the um, a, a link between uh, BDD and borderline personality disorder. A couple of people asked if, if there is a correlation between the two and whether or not treatments for borderline personality may help people with uh, body dysmorphic disorder. Yeah, that... It's another good question. You know, there are a number of studies, uh, somewhere between five and 10, have been done looking at comorbidity of BDD with uh, personality disorders. We find a pretty broad range, anywhere from 40% to 100%, I think reflecting 
where that 100% came from. The 40% was from a kind of a, a large sample of convenience, 200 patients. Um, the 100% was at a place that offers very intensive treatment for BVD. So that may explain that range. Uh, I'm guessing it's about two thirds on average, if I think across the studies. Now, it, it's the cluster C uh, personality disorders that are most common, most often avoidant. Although it can be hard to separate out avoidant from early onset BDD consequences, right? Because BDD is characterized by rejection sensitivity and social avoidance and esteem, self-esteem issues. So, but nonetheless, avoidant is is the most common in, mo in most studies. Uh, some have found high rates of OCPD. Uh, when we compared uh, BDD to OCD directly, we found that uh, the one uh, personality disorder that was higher in BDD was paranoid, which is interesting because they often, yeah, that's that didn't surprise me actually. Um, the cluster B personality disorders are far less common, um, but sometimes, uh, you know, borderline is probably in the five. I, I can't, I can't look for it right now, but it's maybe about five percent, uh, maybe a little bit more of patients with BDD have borderline. Again, it's going to depend on the study, where the rates vary considerably. But I think you know you're probably more likely to see comorbid borderline or narcissistic. Um, or other challenging personality disorders in places like Silver Hill, right, where you're getting more difficult patients and more challenging patients and the personality disorder can really complicate the treatment, you know, especially when it's a cluster B uh, personality disorder. So you may be more likely to see those patients. And yes, I think um, some of these patients really need treatment of both the BDD and the personality disorder and any other comorbidity that might be especially problematic. So yeah, I would I would address both the borderline and and the BDD ideally concurrently if you, if you could. Great. One question that someone asked, which is a really relevant question, is uh, asking about um, what's happening now with COVID and now that people are attending classes online and how the pandemic has affected people with BDD. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, no data. We don't have any data. I think in some ways it might be harder for some patients and easier for others, but I think overall it's it's making it's it, it's making BDD more difficult for a lot of people because I think people who are unfortunately may be unemployed now because of the pandemic have more free time and then that's more time to be at home, unstructured time, more time to be at home, do their rituals, go online, start comparing themselves with the most beautiful people they can find. Um, I think Zoom can be a, or other plat similar platforms can be a real problem because, um, you know, they may just be comparing themselves with everyone else or just staring at their own photo and zeroing in on what they don't like. So in some, in some you know, you, you can do rituals with, with FaceTime or Zoom or any of these platforms. Uh, I, there's some people who have contacted me about um, see me for consultation, but they won't if it's going to be video. I, I think because it can be so hard for them to, you know, uh, see themselves and you can also always turn their video off, but that's not ideal. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, there, there are increased opportunities. The pandemic, unfortunately, offers increased opportunities for the, some of the rituals. And also it's harder to go out and do social, you know, to, to be around other people and do social exposures which we encourage as part of CBT for BDD. We don't want people hiding you know, in their apartments. We want to encourage them as they can to go out and, and socialize. And so that's also challenging. Some people might find it a little easier if they have concerns about their lower face, they can camouflage with a mask. You know, I think so for some it's maybe a little easier, but I think for many the pandemic has made things more difficult. And then you add in the, just the stress of the pandemic in general, not being able to connect with loved ones or possibly being unemployed or underemployed and, you know, not knowing what's going to happen next. And so, uh, you know, stress is not good for BDD. It can make BDD symptoms worse um, for those who have BDD. Thank you. Um, one interesting question um, uh, asked about um, uh, teenagers and young adults with BDD. As the, the, given the high prevalence and onset before age 18, what strategies strategies would you give 
parents, aside from getting them help, um, so they don't unintentionally add fuel to the fire and make things worse. Mm -hmm. It's so hard for the parents. It really is, um, especially when they have a child with very severe BDD. They may be wondering about their safety. So, you know, I encourage them, the parents, to check in about that, to ask, you know, how are you feeling and are you having any thoughts that life isn't worth living? Are you having thoughts of harming yourself? In some, in fact, in many cases, that's that's necessary. Um, the parents, you know, can, can do so-called accommodation, right, of participating in rituals, which we see in OCD. And it can be very hard not to because the, the, their child may be just so insistent, you know, with the reassurance seeking or tell me how I look or insisting on cosmetic procedures or, um, you know, asking for more mirrors to be put up. We, I, I suggest that all extra mirrors be taken down and, and early in the treatment, in fact, cover any ascent, quote unquote, essential mirrors because it can be the mirrors just are so toxic and eventually we want people to be able to handle them. Um, and but we don't we want no extra checking. We don't want mirrors in the living room or the hallway. Uh, that just triggers BDD. Um, I think um, not uncommonly the parents need some help, professional help themselves. Um, I, I always like to meet with the parents uh, from time to time or talk with them about how not to accommodate the rituals, how to encourage their child to go out and do things but not you know push them too hard the parents do need to be involved in cognitive behavioral therapy for bdd the our cbt is modified for adult, uh, for adolescents in a number of ways and one is more extensive you know is parental involvement in the in the treatment um giving rewards when patients make gains uh we do that more often for the adolescents um but it's 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 very very hard for the parents we Try and help them not to be critical, and that can be hard too. Just um, it's it's easy, you know, when your child is an hour late for school because they're stuck in the mirror trying to redo their hair, look, which looked fine to begin with an hour ago. So um, we try to lower the expressed emotion if possible, reduce the accommodation, um, involve them in the treatment, and um, have them, you know. Contact Silver Hill if necessary, <laughs> really for more intensive for more intensive treatment if necessary. One of the patients actually asked uh, one of the patients one of the um, the uh, the participants asked if uh, you could put up the slide that showed the the books and guides because I think that th th there there are a lot of people who have interest in knowing. There, yeah, perfect. Um, so full disclosure, I'm an author on one, but they, they are the only two with evidence good, you know, evidence from good studies to support them. They're different. They're both CBT based. Uh, they're a little different. Um, the one on the left is much more specific in terms of a session by session guide. But what I always say is if try one, if that doesn't work, try the other. Um, but, you know, I should also add that some of these patients need additional supportive therapy to deal with life issues, because as you know, CBT is very structured. And if you start getting derailed by talking about what's going on day to day in the person's life, you're not going to make much progress. Some of them also need family therapy, you know, especially the adolescents um, or the young adults who are still very involved with their families. So not uncommonly, we'll, you know, we'll add, add these other treatments in, which can be very important, or treatment for a personality disorder, that kind of thing. So some of these patients end up with a, a, a lot of different treatments concurrently. Well, I have a question to ask as well. If if I have a patient, I had somebody whose um, son is in, going off to college and she wanted a resource. I gave her your name, <laughs> but because okay. but they're from this area. But is there a website like a you know, an alliance, uh, you know, for resource. Yeah. For you can go to the International OCD Foundation, which has kind of taken BDD under its wing, and you can look for therapists. Now, they're not vetted, right? The organization doesn't vet them. These are people who say they treat OCD and or related disorders. So, you know, if you look through, um, you can find therapists um, with you know, different types of training and degrees. Not all of them are going to treat BDD, so you want to look at 
what they say they treat. But I would always recommend one of these manuals. Um, and uh, there are not many uh, psychiatrists on that site. So what I say to patients if I don't know someone in the areas, you know, medication treatment of BDD is very similar to that for OCD. So if you can find a psychiatrist who specializes in OCD, because you probably won't find someone who specializes in BDD or you may not, that, that would be good because uh, we treat it similarly in terms of the tendency to use the higher SRI doses, SRIs is the first line, adding in atypicals, increasingly the glutamate modulators, um, sequential SRI trials if necessary, et cetera. All right, we have time for a few more, but um, there's a question about uh, uh, differentiating between eating disorder related body dissatisfaction and BDD related concerns. That's the hardest differential uh, in, in my experience. So usually BDD is pretty easy to differentiate from other disorders. Some, sometimes it gets confused with OCD because symmetry concerns, symmetry of the body, that should be BDD, not OCD. Uh, it's an appearance concern. Um, but the eating disorders can be difficult. So, you know, if a pa as I said earlier, if a patient's a full-fledged eating disorder, uh, you would, and, and the, their body image concerns are only that they're too fat or part of their body is too fat, big thighs, you know, big stomach, I weigh too much. You would diagnose the eating disorder, not BED, and treat the eating disorder. Um, although our manual can be helpful for the body image side of things, uh, some eating disorder treatments focus a lot just on food, but I think increasingly they're addressing body image concerns too. But what's more difficult is the uh, now, uh, other, uh, other specified feeding and eating disorder, the new version of NOS, you know, it's kind of that no man's land of not a full-fledged eating disorder, but kind of an eating disorder and kind of BDD. Um, and that's a very tough differential. And so sometimes it's really hard to say, is the concern with the fat stomach, is it more BDD? Is it more an eating disorder? Now, you know, the more abnormal eating they have, the more you, well, you have to pay attention to any abnormal eating, but sometimes they'll have just calorie counting and they diet, you know, and they exercise a little too much. And sometimes that differential is hard. That, that's the hardest is with other specified feeding eating disorder and BDD. What I do in terms of treatment is, you know, if there are any medically concerning uh, eating problems, that always has to be attended to, definitely. Um, but I think the body image concerns can be treated as if it's BDD, and kind of the less concerning uh, eating and behaviors can be incorporated into the BDD treatment. So I've treated quite a few of these patients. You know, patients thought she was too fat, and she wasn't, and she was very ill, actually, been to multiple intensive treatment programs. Um, but no purging, you know, no vomiting, no, uh, no, her weight was fine. Um, so I wasn't no medically concerning situations or behaviors. I just treated it as if it was BDD and meds, um, sertraline and lorazidone and a full course of CBT and she's now symptom free. So, but I, I think that differential is challenging and you kind of have to use your clinical judgment, you know, on which way to go with the treatment. Um, but you don't, you know, don't want to overlook an eating disorder and attend to that if it's problematic. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I have so many good ones here, but um, this question is about uh, if there was any research on the occurrence of BDD in the transgender population. And I'm going to expand that into LGBTQ. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, that as I was saying, that the differential with other specified feeding and eating disorders is the most typical. I'm also thinking gender dysphoria. So I'm glad you asked that question because that's the other tough one for some patients. So, you know, I think. Um, it, there's really no data on BDD and gender dysphoria um, as a diagnosis, and very little is known about BDD per se in that population. Um, you know, and I'm, when I'm thinking about diagnostically, you know, I think it's another example of where if the gender dysphoria diagnostic criteria are met, I would diagnose that not the BDD, but again, you can have both. And I would also say that the body image dissatisfaction and gender dysphoria, and there are some papers on this, it does extend just beyond sex characteristics, right? It can, if it's sort of related to the gender dysphoria, I kind of consider that part of the gender dysphoria. So a patient I saw uh, was female, very much wanted to be male, 
uh, she was very short. She was like 5'11", and she was very concerned about her height. So I kind of thought of that as part of the gender dysphoria. On the other hand, having treated some of these patients, when they're, even if the diagnosis is, is gender dysphoria, if they have a lot of obsess, a lot of obsessions, and these obsessions about about their body, and they're interfering with their day to day life, like this young woman, very bright young girl, was starting to skip class and and was obsessing for five, six, seven hours a day about her height. Um, I did recommend treatment with an SRI, you know, which really ended up helping. Of course, in addition to treatment for gender dysphoria which I don't provide that, you know, I, I, she was in treatment with people who specialize in that disorder. But I think, you know, when the body image obsession, you know, when body image concerns and gender dysphoria become BDD-like, you know, you could consider adding um, some BDD treatment in addition to attending the gender dysphoria by people who specialize in that area. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Phillips. This was really a wonderful talk, and I want to thank everybody for attending. As a reminder, you can get the uh, attendance sign-on evaluation sur survey that's published in Q&A. That concludes the grand rounds. Thank you very much. Thank you.